Completely aside from that, Sermon on the Mount. We're going to continue our, our sermon series on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. And, and if your, your, your question is, how, how many parts is there? I have no idea. I, I can tell you this. This I do know, that I don't know if you've realized or really looked at it. In Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount is chapter 5, 6, and 7. You know, so he, the Sermon on the Mount is stretched over three chapters in, in the Sermon on the Mount. It, and this is, gonna, this is more or less an expositional type sermon series. We're not, I'm not doing the whole chapter like I did in Romans like a year, year and a half ago. But we are going to do these three, these three chapters. Why? And again, because Jesus, you know, who we know is fully God, fully man, he, you know, he would have he would, he would have been the author, you know, of, of the law. He's interpreting the law, which which is a very beautiful thing, B- because we see the law being misinterpreted. We see we see scripture misinterpreted, you know, a lot, you, you know. So it's we we kind of see. But th- we have this window in time where God himself is saying, this is what I meant. He, you know, and that, that's kind of a cool thing if you think about it. You know, there's no room, there's really no room here, you, you, you know, when, when Jesus said, this is, this is what the intent was. This is what, this is what I mean. This, this is the, how high the standard is, you know, of the law. And, and later, once we realize how difficult it is, to actually abide by the law, we understand that much more the work of the cross. You know, when we realize how impossible it is for us to, to be righteous by the law standard because, you know, if you, you know, lust after a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. That's a, that's a high bar. You know, so, but we get appreciation for the high bar for the law so that when Christ died for our forgiveness, we understand exactly what he was taking upon his shoulders. You know, we understand how, how, how dark our heart would have been beforehand and, and how when he wiped us clean and, and, we, and we were forgiven and found not guilty now of all of our sins, we realize how, how high the sin debt was in our life. Because sometimes, you know, it's real, easy, it's, it's real easy to kind of overlook our own sins, is it not? Because particularly if it's something that we struggle with, we can, it can exist with us in our life, and, and, and we're just kind of comfortable with it. You know, that's one of the reasons that I think the Bible says that, that um, bad company, well, it corrupts good character. Why? Because when you're around something and, you're, and, and you start being okay with it, you, should, you just start relaxing around it. So I think that's the way it is sometimes with our sin. So every once in a while, it's nice to have somebody like Jesus come along and say, this is, you might feel comfortable with this, but this is the standard. You know, and this is what the Sermon on the Mount is. I mean, ginormous. It's huge. But last week, we actually finished the first chapter, chapter 5. And we're going to dig now into chapter 6. The first four verses kind of go like this. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. There's a lot here. And, and again, and I've mentioned this time and time again, over and over and over, one of the most important things in in whether we're right or wrong by the law, a lot of it has to do with our heart condition. <laughs> you know, what your, your intent is, what's in your heart, makes, means everything to God. Everything. You, you know, so when, so when we see this thing about giving, you know, so what is he talking about? You know, when I was a kid, and I was in children's ministry at, 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 at Pikeside United Methodist Church, one of the few Bible lessons I actually still remember, I mean, I, I can even picture the little handout I got, was this story of, of the widow's offering. In fact, we're going to look at that in a second. But, but we, we kind of saw the Pharisees and stuff off to the side, you know, with their bags of money. They were, you know, they were giving it. And it and of course, this is a, this is a kid's illustration but, but we see that, that they were making a big deal. Look what I have given. I've given the Lord so much. 
You know, I'm giving, look at this, I give the Lord all of this. And then off to the side, and again, we're going to look at this passage. We see the little old lady, and she had the two, they're called mites. You know, what are those mites we call them? They, they look like two little pennies in the picture. And she, she's very quietly off to the side, and she puts her two little mites in. We're going to look at that. But, but what, what is Jesus saying here? He, you know, don't make a spectacle out of, out of your giving. He, you, you know, you don't need to be, you, you don't need to, okay, I put in an extra $100 bill on the offering. So God, good Lord, everybody, I put in an extra $100 in the offering. Think about all the hungry people that are going to get fed because of me. Thank you, Jesus. You know, that is not, that, that, that does not honor God. You, you, you know, if, if, if the Lord has blessed you particularly in, 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 a, in a paycheck and you put in an extra $100 for it to be used for the work of the Lord, you don't have to tell everybody about it because, you, you, you know, what, once, once it's, it's been put in the, in, into the work or the service of the Lord, we have to trust Him for that money to be used and, 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 and for God to lay on the hearts of leadership to be used in the way that God wants it to be. But we're not supposed to be making a big deal out of it. You know, we're not supposed to, oh, I, I got... I tithe, I tithe 20 percent of my check. You, you know, you'll be going around telling you, God bless you if you do. You, you, you know, thank you if, if you do. But, but, but the Lord doesn't want us bragging about the, our giving. He doesn't want us to brag about the things that we're, we're offering to him. And he's saying, because you know what? If, if you're getting the pat on the back by man, guess what? You've already received your reward. You've already gotten it. You know, so that would tell me a good motivation for me to keep my lips shut and, you know, not make a big deal if I do something. I would rather be rewarded in heaven than be rewarded with the words of the pat on the back by man. So let me tell you what, let me tell you something about the pat on the back of men. I've had that a few times in my life, you know, where where someone's like, oh, you did such a good job on this. You, you, you know, like I got that distinguished service medal, and, and, and there was this, this there was this ceremony, and I got this cool little thing. It's like you, you did a real cool thing. You want to know what? I walked away from that. You know, the only thing I stuck, I got that little medal somewhere in a box somewhere in my house. You, you know, I got my reward for it already. Somebody already made a big deal over it. What I would rather have seen is, is nobody have known what I did, and then when I get to heaven, you say, hey, guess what? Think about it. You should have seen this time that there was this guy trying to hang himself in the tree, and Greg climbed up that tree, was fighting that guy to keep him from hanging himself, cuts that thing, and drags him out of the tree. I'd rather have Jesus telling me, telling this story, than, than getting a little piece of metal attached to a, to, to a ribbon. Do you, you, know, you see what I'm saying here? I would much rather receive the reward from heaven. Because let me tell you what, it doesn't matter how big the reward man can give you, it is nothing in comparison to the, what the Lord can give you. It just can't. You can't outgive God. You can't, you can't, we can't make a, a big enough deal over anything anybody does or any giving that they do more than what Christ can. And let me tell you what, I would rather have the, the praise of anything I've ever done on the lips of my Savior than anybody else. Because that's what really, really matters. That's what really, really matters. So, yeah, maybe we shouldn't talk so much about it because we would rather receive our reward in heaven. So here's the story I was just telling you about. This is in Luke 21 through 4. It says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. Picture these rich folk with these big old bags of money. It doesn't even say they put it in the offering box. They're putting it in the treasury. I mean, they're putting bags of money in there. And, and he saw the poor widow put in two very small copper coins, as widow mites. I've got one that mom gave me. It was, I'm, I'm assuming it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a replica, but the thing's only like this big. And, and if I recall from my, my, my church lesson when I was a kid, it, it, it's like each one of those aren't even like worth a penny today. I, I mean, it's a little bit. It was just a little bit. But Jesus says, truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, and she put all that she had to live on. So what did she do? Those two little tiny copper coins, dink, dink, as opposed to the big old bags of money over here, what blessed Christ's heart? It wasn't the big bags of money. Let me tell you about the big bags of money. All the cattle on the hill, guess what? He already owns them. There's nothing here that isn't already his. 
So if you're going to try to impress God with your giving, if you're going to say, oh, I'm, I'm going to give, I'm going to give $50,000 this year, you, you know, you're not going to impress God. What impresses God is the attitude, the joyful giving. This lady, she gave all that she had. You know, you, 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 can't, you can't impress the creator of the universe with gold. You can't impress him with diamonds. You can't impress him with platinum. Because guess what? He made it in the first place. He made it. But what impresses him is, is when the heart is pure. And when they give, and this woman gave all that she had. So what was, what was the even bigger gift here? What was the bigger? We're not helping the little thing. Think, what did she give him? She gave him her faith. It, for her to have given in the offering everything, everything that she had, that says, I have the faith that God's going to take care of me. And that it doesn't matter what I have in this world, he's more important. Can you, did you catch that in the story? Did you catch that in the story of the widow's offering or the widow's might, whatever you call it? That, that she's saying, well, everything that I have, he's worth more to me. He's, he's given me everything, so I'm going to give him everything. So this isn't, this isn't an offering lesson. This isn't an offering sermon. I'm not up here to try to like bolster the, you, you know, the giving in the plates out, or, or the boxes out there. That's not what this is about. This is about understanding I don't care if you put in a penny or you write a check for thousands of dollars and put it in there. Do it with the correct attitude. Do it with the attitude of, I want to do this for my Lord. I want to do this because I love him. And that's, make sure your heart is right. Because I will be honest. If you're giving and your heart's not in it, just don't even do it. And Kathy's like, ah, don't tell them that. <laughs> She watches the pennies. That's why I say, no, don't tell them that. But I would rather you keep your money. I'd rather you not put a dime in that offering if you're doing it because you're trying to impress me or anybody else. Because here's the thing, you want to be honest, I have no idea what anybody gives. I don't count the money. I don't look at it. I don't care what anybody gives. What my thing is, is whatever the Lord lays on your heart, do it. You, you know, this isn't even a lesson about the tithe. What this is, the lesson, your heart attitude. You know, I will be more excited that if you put in a few pennies and you did it for the joy of the Lord and, and, and to please him as opposed to trying to just make sure the lights stay on. And the lights need to be staying on. Don't, I'm not, but you know what I'm saying. It is so important that we give with a good heart. Here's another story, John 12. We're going to look at a couple little slides here, just three quick slides. Six days before the Passover. So what does this mean? Actually, let me read on. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now I can stop there. So this visit to Bethany, this is after Lazarus was raised from the dead. This is six days before the Passover. So let's kind of put this in perspective. When, when in, the, in the life of Jesus is this? This is six days before, the, before he's tried and crucified. So this is, this is kind of the end of the story as far as his earthly ministry. We're, we're getting there. So this is a very important, this is a very important thing. This is, this is shortly before he was, he was crucified. Here a dinner was, among, was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among them reclining at the table with them. Did I advance that? Yes, I did. Oh, Martha served while Lazarus was there reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Let, let me explain to you something about nard. You want to talk about expensive? It's expensive. You, you know, let, let me tell you what. Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever gone to, you know, I... I I've, ne I've never seen some of these places where they have these real expensive perfumes. I don't know if you just want to go in like the perfume store. You know, you look at some of the prices, like 150, 200, 300 bucks for a, just, you know, a little bottle. You know, this was like way more expensive than that stuff. 
This was like expensive stuff. This nard, this, this pint, this, this is about a half of a liter. You know, if you're a, if you're a metric person, this is about a half of a liter of nard that she, this really super super expensive perfume that she pours on the feet of Jesus. And it gets here's where it gets even crazier. She anoints his feet and she gets down and she uses her hair and, and, and dries off his feet. Can you imagine, you want to talk about service. You want to talk about a pure heart. You know, what's so, what, what's, what blows me away about the story when, 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 the, when Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, other than the fact that, that he still washed the feet of Judas, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't have. Because he knew it was going to go. If, if it was me, I would have just like, I'm going to wash your 11 feet. You know, Judas, sorry, go do what you're going to do. He, you know, <laughs> Lucky for you, I'm not him. But why was that such a cool thing? Because he lowered himself or humbled himself to the lowest position or the lowest station that he possibly could have in, 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 his, in that context, in that society. Because the person who had to wash feet, it, it was just, it was a low place. And you, you know, if I recall, I've even read someplace in the law where you, you know, the master couldn't even make the slave do it. I mean, it was, it was just, it's just a nasty thing. Why? Because they're like wearing sandals. And they're walking on dusty roads. I mean, they got the dirt in their toes and everything else. And I'm, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a... So feet, feet were not a good thing. I know a lot of people just don't like feet anyway. But I'll tell you what, th this particular thing at this time, not only does she anoint his feet, she towels him off with her hair. You want to talk about somebody who was in love with Jesus? Now, let me tell you what, it was Mary. And when I say in love with Jesus, I'm not talking about in a boyfriend, girlfriend type way. This is, this is somebody who just loved, 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 loved Jesus. Loved Jesus. Mind you, what, what did he do just a little bit before that? She raised his brother from the dead. I mean, she had, she had lots of reasons to, but, but we see even before that, she, she was somebody who liked to be at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because she just loved to be with him. So this, this we're going to continue on with the story. But one of the disciples, there's that Judas. You know, Judas is the guy, whenever you say Judas is scary, everybody should go, boo, boo. You know, Judas, that's the traitor. That's, that's, that's the bad guy in almost every story. Who was later to betray him objective. Why wasn't the perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It is worth a year's wages. Okay, so now we really understand the worth of that, that, that nard. So let me tell you what, that would be like me working from January 1st to December 31st, getting it all in one big paycheck and going out and buying a half a liter of perfume to pour on the feet of Jesus. Big, 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 big deal. He says, that's a year's wages. But here's where John calls him out on it. He says, he didn't say that because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So think about this. Again, it's the heart. It's the heart. Now, now we're looking at, we looked at the, this beautiful heart of Mary. You know, I'm going to spend a year's wages just to anoint the feet of Christ. And, you know, I just want to be with him, show how much I love him, and I appreciate him so much. I mean, he's, he's Jesus. He's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And, you know, you know she's just making a big deal. And then you got the guys like, we could have taken that money. We could have given to the poor. And here's one of the things, you know, where he's not even revealing, you know, what's really, you know, he didn't care less about the poor. He's like, he was saying, you know what? If I could have got, I could have, I could have scooped off three months of somebody's wages and kept that for myself. You know, so we see the heart of Jesus. So what, what, what does this say? Exactly what I've been saying. Your heart is the thing that matters the most. Mary's heart is this beautiful thing. Judas's heart is this dark thing. And the very end of that, he's, Jesus says, leave her alone. He says, it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So this is, this is what many people, including myself, view as, as her literally anointing him and for his death, even before he died. 
This was, a, this was an intimate moment. This was, a, this was a very special moment. You know, this is the moment that you, if you had been sitting there, I mean, just absorb the gravity of what was going on. And then, again, the guy with the dark heart, who could have shown that and made money? The heart is so, so important. And he said, the poor will always be among you. It's, you won't always have me. You know, so it's okay. He said, especially in this context, they didn't realize in, in, in just a little over a week, he was going to be gone for a period of short, a short period of time. And then after that three days, the, the, another very short period of time, and he was going to be for, in the body away from them. They, I don't think they truly understood all of this. But what he's also saying, it's okay. You know, it's okay to make a big deal over Jesus. It's okay for us to make a big deal over Jesus. You know, it's okay to give him our very best as long as it's because of our heart, because of our love for him. One last example. In this story, the Lord tells David, he says, go out and buy this, buy this place and build, build an altar. So, so David goes to this guy named, I'm assuming this is Arunah. We're going to say, we're going to call it that, even that's not how you say his name. And, and he came to this Arana guy and says, okay, I want to buy this. And, 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 and the guy's like, oh, I'll give it to you. I'll give you the land. I'll, I'll give you everything you need. I'll even give you the, the oxen. You can sacrifice to the Lord. I'll give you all this. And what's David say? He, he, he says, no, I insist on paying full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering, something that costs me nothing. You know, so here's another piece of it. There is, this, there is this, this aspect of giving, you know, that, that there should be some level of sacrifice. You know, David, David's re- revealing this, that there should be some level of sacrifice. But we shouldn't be focusing on the sacrifice. We should begin focusing on the Lord to whom we give the sacrifice. You know, so, so David's saying, I, I don't want to... I don't want to give to the Lord something that costs me nothing. It should cost me something. Sermon on the Mount. I'm, I'm telling you, Jesus ties so much stuff together. The last little section we're going to look at is, is this. We're going to start out Matthew 6, 5 through 6. And when you pray, do not, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. And again, you realize he is judging their hearts here. Again, this is the same thing. Just like he was judging their hearts in their giving, he's now judging their hearts in their praying. He says, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Here's this reward thing again. They've received their, you know, they're getting the pat on the back of the man for their, oh dear God. We thank you, Lord, King of the universe, giver of the vine, provider of all things. Oh, dear God, we, we appreciate you so much. And they were using this, this big language. They were using these big words and these long prayers, and they're just trying to, they're trying to impress people with how smart they are. And what's Jesus saying? I'm not that impressed. That don't, that's like that Shania Twain song. That don't impress me much. Here's the beautiful thing about prayer. I'm going to see, here's a little side note thing. Your prayers don't have to be big, fancy, wordy things. They really don't. Because I'm going to tell you what, you're, again, you're not going to impress the Lord with your vocabulary. You're not going to impress the Lord with your vocabulary. You're not going to impress the Lord with how much scripture you can pray. Mind you, I think praying scripture is important. You know, because that that ties your prayers with with the promises of God and with the the things of God. You know, so I'm not saying don't pray scripture. I think that's huge. I think that's wonderful. But you're not going to impress him with how much, how many verses you've tied in with your prayers. He says, truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 
Again, where do you want your rewards? Do you want, you want your, your brothers and sisters in church to be patting you on the back about your cool prayers? Or do you want the Father in heaven to reward you in heaven? And again, I want my reward in heaven. I want my reward in heaven. And he continues. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be, in fact, let's stop there. It's okay to pray long prayers. As long as, if you're working out something, you're flushing out something in, in, in your prayer time, but what, what's babbling? Babbling doesn't, babbling has nothing to do with, you, you know, how, the link. This has, just ram, have you ever heard somebody that would just yammer and yammer and yammer and yammer and yammer, and at the end of 20 minutes, you're like, what did they just say? You, you, know, you might say, think that about me sometimes on Sunday mornings. But that's babbling. What, what he's saying is, you, you know, it's okay to pray as long and as hard as you want. We see Jesus do that. We see Jesus going off by himself to pray to the Father. We see him at Gethsemane just, just really just praying his heart out. And just, just, just uh, I mean, in a time where he's under so much stress, he's bleeding, he's sweating blood. You know, so it's okay to bring these things and talk to the Lord as long as you need. But he, he's saying, he's saying, you don't have to be like them, for your father knows what you need before you even ask. So he's saying, bring these things to the Lord. Bring your concerns to the Lord and bring them to the, the, until you find that, that release or, or you just, just, just really just feel like you've just broken through. But you don't have to just, just yammer, 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 yammer. But here's the other important thing. Even if you pray long prayers, it's okay to pray long prayers. But it's also okay just to be, God help me. God help me. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. Do you realize that that prayer means more to him than anything else? That, God help me. You're saying to the Lord, I know I need you. I know I don't know what to do, and I need you. So, so whatever the Lord is just laying on your heart, speak it. Whatever's just stirring in your heart, speak it to him. And, and, and is it important sometimes, and this is why I don't want, I don't want this babbling thing to be, to be a hang-up, because we see in another place, Jesus tells a story about the, the, the woman who came to the unrighteous judge. You know, so what he was teaching in that, that story was it's okay to be persistent in your prayers. You know, even, even though he knows what you need, it's okay to be persistent in your prayers because in that story, the, the, the woman kept coming to the unrighteous or the unfair judge and kept asking for justice. And then eventually the judge gave it to her. And, and what was he saying? You know, if even through persistence, even an a not-so-good judge will eventually give justice. How much more quickly would a good judge want to answer your prayers? So we see it's okay to be persistent in prayer. There are people who pray for the salvation of loved ones for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. It's okay. He wants you to be persistent in your prayers. And he wants you to come to him with, with just this open heart of realizing who he is. He wants us to recognize that you are, you are Yahweh. You are I am. You are my provider. You're my protector. You're my comforter. He wants you to bring to him in, in your prayer this attitude of getting who he is. And the fact that you come to him because you know who he is. And he, you know that he is the one that has the ability to answer that prayer. That you have the faith to come to him knowing that he can answer that prayer. That is what attracts God. That is what attracts God. And then he continues with this little piece. We see this expanded someplace else. And we, and we have a name for it. The full thing we like to call it the Lord's Prayer. He says, pray like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
here's something that's really important about this. And, that's, I, and, and I, I'm at 11:30, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I, trust me, I get where I am. I get. Where, but this is something you could do an entire sermon on just this little bit. This little bit of thing. Are we supposed to treat the Lord's prayer? It's almost like something that, that we just recite it in a religious way. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Just, just like it's something we're just saying because he said, oh, you know, pray like this. The answer is no. But what he's showing us here is what's important in our prayer. Recognizing that God is the, our God, that he's, our, he's in heaven, he's our Father in heaven. Recognizing that he is holy. Hallowed be your name. Recognizing that, that the kingdom of God is, has, has not only been established here, it's coming in a greater and greater way, and that there's a time when we will be living just in the kingdom of God, recognizing the greatness of what that means. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be praying that the will of God happens here, just as it is in heaven. You know, it's not words, it's an attitude of God. You know what? There's this person over here on the street. God, I know it's your will that, that, that they be cared for. You know, I want your will to happen here just like it wouldn't be. Just because you want it, God, I want that person cared for. Help that person, Lord. You know, so it doesn't always look just like, give us our daily bread. Give us what we need to survive, God. We need you. You are our provider. You are Jara. Recognize it. Forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses. Whatever version you read. He said, forgive us for the stupid stuff we've done as we forgive people who've done stupid stuff to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, we even see this in Gethsemane. Jesus is praying and he's praying for us. And he said, or his disciples, like, he's like, God, Father, he said, don't take them out of the world, but protect them in the world. So he was, there's another way he, he was saying the same thing in different words. It's the attitude. These are the things that are important. If, if we just recite the Lord's Prayer, and again, I'm not knocking on, you, you know, it, it is a good thing. I think it's a cool thing every once in a while, just in unison, everybody's saying the Lord's Prayer. I'm not saying that's, a, I think it's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is this, it's not a matter of, 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 of the, these magic words all lined up in this order make this thing, but it shows us our attitudes and our prayer and the things that should be important to us. And he ends with this, in this passage. Well, he doesn't end with this. This is where we're ending with it today. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Can I be honest here? That's a difficult passage for me. That's a hard passage for me. I believe he said it. I believe the Bible is 100% true. I don't think it contradicts itself. I don't think any of these things. But, you know, so when Jesus says, this is some heavy words here. Forgive people. When they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your sins won't be forgiven. It's not only the only place that we see this. Here's why this is difficult for me. There are some passages in the Bible that when you first read them, they're, they're like difficult to look at. And you're like, what in the world? What in the world were they saying? And, and, and it's like, and it's kind of like, you know, the one I always use in examples when I talk about difficult passages is in the Psalms. Blessed, you know, blessed is the God that dashes the children on the rocks. You know, and you're like, wow, they, what's he mean? And then you got to really, you got to look at the context. You got to look at who it is. This, this is somebody crying out for justice in this passage in, in the Psalms. It, it's not contradictory to anything that's in the Bible. This is the person because the Assyrians, when they would come in and take over people, they would dash their children on the rocks to completely break their spirits, to break who they're, to just completely destroy them mentally and, and physically and, and, and try to break them spiritually. So, so the psalmist who is saying, you know, blessed is the person that dashes the children on the rocks. It, it, it's not saying God is okay and likes people dashing babies on the rocks. This is, a, this is the, the writer of the psalms is crying out to God for justice. 
That's what's going. That's a little easier to explain, even though when you first read it, you're like, what the now? How do I reconcile this? But here's, here's what's so hard for me in this passage. I can be honest with you. This, 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 and, and I'll explain to you kind of my take on this, but this is, you're going to have to take this or leave this. You, you, you know, based on your, your own prayers and your own seeking through on this. I do know that this passage does not contradict anything because that's just, I had the faith to believe the Bible doesn't do that. And this is somebody quoting Jesus. So, you know, so you don't ever just try to, hmm, you, know, you know, with anything Jesus says. But what do I know about grace? What do I know about the work on the cross? I know that there's no condemnation for those who were in Christ Jesus. I, I, I do know that all of my sins were, were forgiven. I, I was forgiven of everything because of the work of the cross. Well, now we have this saying, well, you, you know, if you don't forgive others, I'm not going to forgive you. You know, how do you reconcile that? You, you, you know, and first of all, I'm going to say right off the top, I don't have the answer for that. But here's, here's, here's my take. And this, is, this comes through not, not some, some long books I've read or something I, I've read. You know, when I really look at, and, and, I'm not, and I don't think this is hyperbole at all. I've talked about hyperbole, you know, you know the cutting off the hand, the, the sin, gouging the eyes, you know, the other cheek thing. You know, so I do believe I, this does not feel like hyperbole in any way. But we do also look at, and, and here's where I'm going with this, and, and again, you have to accept this or reject this based on your prayers. And I'm not even 100% sure I've really, really bought into this whole thing first. But what we see in all the passages leading up to it, we see him talking about your rewards, you know, your rewards in heaven. You, you, you know, if you get your reward here, you know, you're not getting in heaven, but what it's unseen. You know, so this is something to pray about. Do we take this exactly straight up? Which I'm saying, I, I take Scripture straight up. So if, you, if this is how you're saying, no, no, this is what this is, it means exactly, bless you. But I believe looking at the last, the last couple chapters when he's talking about reward and rewards in heaven, if I believe that I'm forgiven of everything, what, what might this mean? I would argue, I would argue that keeping in the same train of thought that he's been following on, that if you don't forgive others, that if you do forgive others, that you will be rewarded in heaven. I believe that anyway, because if, if you look at if you look at kind of the judge or the, the judgment of the unrighteous and then kind of the party of the of the righteous, where, where, where you know they open up the book of works and they celebrate everything you've done, I, I think when you forgive people that are hard to forgive, I think that's something that's going to be recorded in that book that's going to be celebrated. But is there a possibility that you that if you don't forgive somebody? You know, is this something that you're just not going to, you're not going to receive that reward? You know, this isn't something, you're, would you rather in heaven, everybody's like, yeah, he forgave the unforgivable, or she forgave the unforgivable, you want, or do you want dead silence when they're reading your, well, you know, when your, your works in the, in the book is being read out, just, just crickets, when we get the forgiveness, do you want them to say, he, he forgave, or she forgave, or do you want to hear, chirp, 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 the crickets. And again, I'm not telling you. I'm not, I'm not telling you how to interpret this. Because this is something I still pray about. <laughs> this is something I still, because I know what Jesus says does not contradict anything else that's in the law, that's anything else he's ever said. He doesn't contradict any, anything else. But whether it's meant just that way, if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven, or if it's meant in the context of if you don't forgive, you're missing out. You're missing out on, on, on a really big opportunity to be celebrated in heaven. However you want to, or, or some, however you, that, that, that works itself out in your spirit. Here's the big point of it, though. Regardless of how you reconcile, however, you, however you've just come together with this thing. Here's the big point. Forgive. Because if you forgive, guess what? You don't have to figure out which version is correct. 
You don't have to, you don't have to worry about, is this literal? Or you don't have to, you don't have to worry about, it. or is this, is this about reward? Because he's talking about rewards leading up to this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, 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 what this was meant. It doesn't matter because if you forgive, guess what? You're covered. <laughs> You're covered. You're supposed to be forgiving anyway. And again, preaching to the choir. I've never, I've never gotten up here and tried to say I was an easy forgiver. <laughs> I've never said that. So the important point, if you take anything out of that little piece, take, you got to forgive. You got to forgive. But let me tell you what. Let me tell you, as somebody who's a hard forgiver, when you don't forgive, you know the only person that's miserable. It's you. <laughs> they don't care. The person that hurts you, they don't care. They don't care. And there's somebody else in my life who's really struggling with forgiveness. And what I see in this person is they're miserable. They're miserable. Why? And it's that root of unforgiveness. So however you take that, however you take that passage, the important thing is you got to forgive. I have to forgive. Sermon on the Mount. Whew. Heavy stuff. Makes your head hurt sometimes. But I am so thankful. I'm so thankful for this passage. I'm so thankful for everything that he said that Matthew recorded in these three chapters because it gives clarity to so much. Let's just go ahead and pray. Father, I...